Welcome to another edition of Dreamland. Uh, on the website, there is a new Whitley's Journal up. Don't miss this. It is about an encounter experience I had last February, the first one in quite a long time, that contained a truly profound and unexpected lesson. I don't think you will ever have read anything quite like it. I don't think there's been anything quite like it. It's one of these genuinely new things that happened, and You'll be most fascinated, and stay tuned later because Linda has got an extraordinarily chilling report about something just awful happening to elk in the Pacific Northwest that you don't want to miss. Before that, we're going to have Greg Braden with us talking about his book, The God Code. Uh, he has discovered the name of God written in every cell of every living organism. The kingdom of heaven is within you, Jesus said, and it turns out to be quite literally true. We are marked with the name of God. Prepare to be awed by this. Next week, one of the greats of our era will be with us. Russell Targ has got a new book, Limitless Mind, out Russell is one of the founders of the SRI Research Institute remote viewing program that led to a whole new way of looking at mankind and looking at the world. He is truly one of the greats of our era. So be prepared to be awed next week again by Russell Targ. It's going to be very, very exciting stuff. For our subscribers this week, we have got an incredible program. We've got... Filer, George Filer of Filer's Files is going to be with us, and he's talking about Mars. I think you probably are aware of the fact that George has been quoted in newspapers around the country and around the world recently saying there's something more to the Mars photos that are coming back than NASA and JPL are willing to admit. Well, let's hear what he has to say, and uh, I urge you, by the way, subscribe to UnknownCountry.com. It's just the best thing you could possibly do for your own mind. Open it and open it wide with a subscription. Be generous to us because we are generous to you and you can keep this thing going by being a subscriber. Take responsibility for Unknown Country. Help us. Subscribe. Go to the subscribe tab now. Now, for you subscribers, you'll find that there are little silences here and there in the show, very short ones. This is where the commercials that the people who are listening on the main website are hearing aren't because they don't go into the subscriber section. So I hope you enjoy that aspect of it. You'll just hear an occasional commercial about the book itself, uh, the, the author's book of the week, and that will be it. There will be nothing else. And although I think this week there may be a couple of extra ones in the Linda Moulton House section, that will not normally happen. It did this week, but it normally won't. So enjoy the show as much as I am enjoying it. I'm having I'm such an exciting time with this. This is really something, Greg Braden, it's awesome stuff. Uh, this is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We'll be right back. Well, I am very happy to have Greg Braden back with us. It's always a wonderful experience uh, interviewing Greg because this is somebody who stays way, way out at the leading edge, uh, which is where we'd all love to be all the time, and some of us are and some of us aren't, but Greg certainly is. And he's got a new book out called The God Code, which is nothing less than and discovery about our bodies that it indicates the presence of God within us. Remember, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is within you. Well, Greg has got an extraordinary idea about just what that means, and we're going to get into that during the course of talking about the God Code. Uh, I, we had, I believe, the Isaiah effect on Dreamlands uh, some a year or so ago, a, a very popular show. The God Code, the secret of our past, the promise of our future. Greg, it, could, let's begin by, you have been researching and studying the relationship, I guess, between um, ancient texts and modern knowledge for a long time. Could you tell us where you are kind of coming from at this point? Well, sure, Whitley. I'm, I'm going to begin by saying uh, it, it's a, a pleasure to be here, and it's absolutely exhilarating to be able to share what we're going to to, to speak about over this uh, this next little while. The, the the material that we're going to discuss uh, this evening is uh, it's the result of a research project that began uh, when I was an engineer 
uh, in the defense industry in the last years of the Cold War, and it is an ongoing project. It is yet to be completed. So what we are talking about now is what we know now. And the bottom line to, uh, to the, the research that has happened thus far is that we've found a, uh, a concrete link, a tangible connection between the human genome that describes uh, the cells of, of uh, all life and, and our body specifically, and an ancient alphabet. Uh, and I've got to, to tell you as a scientist, the, the, the concept is absolutely mind-boggling. Uh, and at the same time, it makes so much sense, and it is so eloquent and so simple when we really get into the material and see how it's laid out. Uh, and what it says to us uh, is that beyond a shadow of a doubt, there's an intentionality underlying our existence um, that we are related to one another and to, to all forms of life uh, that, that share this phenomenon with us and very probably uh, to, to, to something even greater. And it is those principles uh, that, uh, that make this material so, so exhilarating to share because of the implications of what they mean in, in our world today. So I know that was a long answer and probably straight off of the brief question you just asked me. But <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. That's but, fine. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a place to begin um, from a, a non-religious, non-denominational perspective as an engineer. Uh, I began a search for a principle, Whitley, that, that would exclude no one, that would include every human who's ever walked this earth, a unifying principle uh, in the hopes that once we find such a principle, it makes the reasons for the wars of our past obsolete. And what historians are telling us right now is the 20th century, uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt, bar none, was the single bloodiest century in all of recorded human history on a per capita basis. And it was also the century in which we made the most advance uh, uh, scientifically and, but interestingly enough, not ethically, because we are still... We did arguably the worst thing in history during the 20th century in the form of the Holocaust, mm. uh, the most terrible crime perhaps that has ever been cre ever been committed by man against man. And I don't include in this, by the way, the crucifixion because it was really not a crime. It was a it was something else uh, entirely, uh, but it, it, but this was definitely a crime, and it was only one of many. The dreadful things that the Japanese did in China were almost beyond the imagination, and yet they revealed a dark part of the human spirit that all of us need to address and accept within ourselves. Otherwise, it will keep returning and eventually, I'm sure, destroy us. Well, this is this is the, the impetus, uh, the many, many reasons uh, for doing the kind of research. And, and we can talk about this throughout the, the program, but the many reasons for doing this research. Uh, as an engineer uh, in the defense industry during the Cold War, I had the opportunity to see behind the scenes how really frightening uh, the events of that war were, and it's a war. The Cold War was a very interesting war. It, it wasn't, didn't have the publicity uh, that many of the other wars have had in the 20th century. Um, you know, we didn't see soldiers uh, arriving in uh, by water, by land, and by air. It was, it was a war that was fought from a very different perspective. On the one hand, on the other hand, uh, many people are simply not aware of how frighteningly close. Both sides came during that time to doing the unthinkable and unleashing uh, the, the worst weapons technology that we've ever developed uh, on a, on a full-scale basis. And, and the thinking that has led to those kinds of wars, to the, what we saw happening in the 20th century and the frightening statistics and the Holocaust that we're speaking about, some of the best minds of our time, right at the turn of the century, they said that the greatest threat to our survival as a species is not the, the impact of a rogue asteroid or, or, uh, or viruses unleashed upon the world or, uh, or even the breakdown of the environment. They said while all those things are, are possible and they're important, they said the next 10 to 15 years are critical in the survival of our species because of our propensity to solve our problems through war 
And the war has been based upon our differences, differences of heritage, bloodlines, borders, um, uh, the color of our skin or our wealth. And the discovery that we're going to speak about here uh, in this program, the discovery of a, a literal text message encoded as the cells of every human who's ever walked this earth, the, the, the existence of that message tells us uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt that at the most fundamental level, uh, at, at the, the, the basis of life itself, those differences simply become obsolete. They fall apart because there is uh, a common code, a common thread, and a message that lives in every cell of every human. And now that we're beginning to understand that message, it invites us to look at ourselves differently. Now, let me, I want to backtrack a little bit, and I want to get into this more deeply, but I want to go kind of in a slightly different direction. I want to begin with where you begin, Greg. You begin, it's the Cold War, you are in the hard sciences. You're an engineer. Uh, you're working for places like Martin Marietta, Phillips Petroleum, Cisco. What happened? What changed you? Or did you change, or did you just begin to? Because this is a such a seems like such a such a departure for you, as if you were set on a kind of a journey. A burning question came to you. What happened? Well, that's a good question. Many people, uh, the way that question comes to me often is is uh, what what was it that uh, that made me take the what many people see as a quantum leap from the the hard sciences into the kinds of things we're speaking about now, and I'm. I guess for me it's less of a leap and less of, uh, of a departure and more of a, of a logical progression, a next step. Uh, for me, Whitley, the study of the sciences has always been a study of, uh, of a higher power and a creation or a force. Uh, as I studied uh, crystal systems as a geologist and uh, uh, ocean sciences and, uh, and, and mathematics and, and the uh, life sciences, those are the ways that we come to know uh, the, the forces of our world today, and the the order, the eloquent order, uh, to me has always been the language of uh, of, of a, something much greater that we're all all related to. So while I I was working as an engineer, and by the way, as a software engineer uh, on the MX missile project, the uh, the Peacekeeper missile, as I was working with those things during the day, the nights and the weekends, I've always uh, taken that time to research the most ancient traditions, the oldest cultures, uh, looking for the wisdom of our past that bridges the, the science of, of our time today in, in a meaningful way. Uh, so it was a, this is, is a logical next step rather than, I think, a radical departure from, uh, from what I've done in the past. The, the impetus, perhaps, was the recognition of what the wars of the 20th century, the, the, the path that they've led us upon, and the realization that the thinking that led to those kinds of wars is still in place. The thinking, that thinking is in place today, early in the 21st century. Well, well, it is in place today, and it's really scary because we are building toward another terrible conflagration it, when you look at the possibility that the environment is going to become less and less able to support us over the next 50 years or 100 years in the sense that we're going to be Oil uh, is going to be reduced in quantity. Uh, prices of oil are going to become much higher, almost unimaginably. So there's a distinct possibility of a sudden climate change and severe environmental breakdown. Under pressure like that, the possibility, as the Pentagon has said just last week, of there being appalling wars of an unimaginable kind exists and, precisely, precisely. And yet, Greg, you speak of in every cell of every life the name of God, and this is what stands for man and against this darkness that seems to be descending upon us. It's as if the 20th century it kind of it lies exhausted at our feet now burned to a cinder, but the coals are still glowing and beginning here and there to flare once again. 
This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We'll get more deeply into the God Code with Greg Braden in just a moment. We'll be right back. Greg Braden, the God Code. We must not be passive. The future depends on us. The God Code represents a key to finding out who we are and how to change this world from within us. Think it can't be done? That's what you're supposed to think. The great lie that we are helpless, that we must remain passive, there is nothing to be done. Wake up to the God Code. Do it today. Get it from the unknowncountry.com store. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We're talking to Greg Braden, the God Code, the secret of our past, the promise of our future. This is something really, really special. I think, Greg, you have made a, speaking of quantum leaps as we were during the last, the first segment, you have made a a quantum leap of understanding here. And I want to go kind of back to the beginning to the fascinating material about the, what is actually being discovered about our genetic heritage. Tell us a little bit about the Neanderthals, for example, and what's been recently discovered about them, this child that was discovered. It's fascinating. Well, this is interesting, Whitley, because uh, some of my, my dearest friends, uh, also people who have, have reviewed this book, there's the scientists, the engineers, and the academic, as well as the corporate world, um, many of them have built their lives and careers upon the study of our past. Uh, from a scientific perspective, and often that comes about through uh, the science of uh, anthropology and uh, uh, the physical remains, the study of the physical remains, uh, specifically the fossil record. And one of the, the theories that was uh, dominant in, uh, in the last part of the 20th century was that, that we are uh, part of this, this evolutionary process and that we have climbed this evolutionary ladder uh, from the point of less evolved hominids to, to where we are today, and if that's true, we should find evidence of them in the fossil record. Well, more than the fossil, in, in 1987, a remarkable discovery was made in uh, in northern Europe. And, you know, I'm, I'm just not sure why this didn't even make the cover of Time magazine. It was just so amazing. Uh, or Newsweek or CNN or, and all those things. But what was found was the the remarkably well-preserved body of a Neanderthal infant, uh, a young girl, uh, that was carbon dated to about 30,000 years old. And this this infant was not fossilized and was not mummified. Her body had been placed in in a cave deep in the earth, uh, apparently 30,000 years ago, and was so well-preserved that her DNA was still intact. And to the best of my knowledge, this was the first time that Neanderthal DNA was preserved well enough it could be compared against modern human DNA to see if, in fact, we have descended or evolved from, uh, from, from that form of life, if there are ancestors. And uh, to make a long story very brief, the, the conclusion to the study was that there was not enough genetic similarity between modern human and this Neanderthal infant to suggest that we actually descended from the infant uh, and subsequent studies have shown that, that modern human uh, very probably shared the earth. We walked the earth with these beings, which means we couldn't have evolved from them, that we were here at the same point in time. And it, it actually kind of throws a, a monkey wrench into the, uh, into the mystery, because if we didn't evolve from them and we were here while they were here, uh, where did we come from? And, uh, and even more recently, uh, midway, I, I guess it was around June, July uh, of 2003, the announcements were made of fossils in northern Africa of humans uh, that are essentially modern humans now dated to about 160,000 years old. Uh, people that look pretty much like you and me 160,000 years ago are, are physiologically, it looks like our bodies haven't changed much during that time. Now, doesn't that, however, weren't those discoveries, wasn't it said that they were, that the skeletons had been washed down into an older strata or something? No, that, that, was, a, that was a different discovery. That was uh, uh, Hans Reck, Louis Leakey, 1931. But this is a, a relative, this is such a new discovery uh, that Scientific American released a special edition in July of 03 
updating uh, the world on on what we know about our our history history through the archaeological uh, I'm sorry the anthropological records and uh, and these were uh, what they found were modern humanoid uh, fossils um, and I'm not sure how many skeletons there were but they were essentially this is the work of Dr. Tim White um, and his uh, his colleagues there are a number of people that are working with him it's a team um, this is the oldest known fossil record of what are essentially modern humans, 160,000 years old. The question is, if, if evolution is ongoing, why hasn't there been much change over that last 160,000 years? All of these studies are asking the question. I think the fact of evolution is clear. Evolution has occurred. We see it in the fossil record. The question is, does evolution alone account for uh, the differences between early hominids and modern human, and does it account for uh, where we find ourselves today? And the jury's still out on that. Well, it also, the question has to be then asked, are people like Michael Cremo right? You know his work, I'm sure. Oh, sure, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the sense that, is there, are we the one in a long succession of civilizations, of human civilizations that have each in its turn been so completely lost that we've had to start over again from scratch or is this the apex of human achievement right now Do well, well certainly and this is this is the great question now in in the anthropological circles there the, the question is are we the product of a long evolutionary ladder uh maybe the punctuated evolution of stephen jay gould has occurred over time uh, and nonetheless, are, are we the, the end product of this, of this long evolutionary process, or do we share a genetic history with these other beings? And at some point along that history timeline, did something happen, some mysterious process occurred that set us apart from other forms of life and set us along our own evolutionary path? Uh, and this is the great mystery now that the jury is out on this uh, because uh, because the evidence is incomplete. When we are finding the kinds of things that we're finding in the genome that we're speaking about now, the, the evidence of a literal text-based message encoded into the essence of life itself, it suggests that we are here uh, intentionally, that there is an intelligence underlying our existence, uh, that we are, in fact, all part of one another, uh, and perhaps uh, a part of, of something even greater than we've ever imagined in, in the past. And, uh, and it, is, it invites us to think of ourselves uh, from, from a very different perspective. Now, you speak of an, of an amazing thing, this, this phrase, a text-based message encoded in us as if, as if somebody has left their, their mark or their brand upon our body. You know, it makes uh, it makes tremendous sense when we when we as a species create something that we're proud of, uh, our, our artwork, uh, paintings, sculptures, uh, even our our technology, uh, the, the minute components in our electronics. Everything that we create has an identifying mark in in some way. Yes. So we know who who that maker is. We're often told in in our most uh, sacred traditions that we are made in the image of, of something else, of, of our Creator, if that is true, it makes tremendous sense that the Creator, whoever that is, would have left uh, a mark of some kind, uh, perhaps even a signature, that once recognized uh, would allow us to understand beyond a shadow of a doubt uh, at least that, that we are an intentional species. We may not know how or who or, or why it happened, but it says that we're, we're no accident. And I think... We're just scratching the surface, and, and we're only beginning to understand, I think, perhaps what uh, what this is really saying to us. But the we'll go into the, the specifics of this discovery. Uh, what we can say in general right now is there is a message encoded into the cell uh, of every human who's ever walked this earth, and uh, and who does so presently. And with that message, it tells us that we are related to one another in the most intimate way imaginable. Um, that we are, uh, we're, we're part of one another and, and very probably part of uh, even a greater existence. 
Now, this is quite a fantastic thing. It, it, you're talking about there being a marker uh, of of God inside us. And I, I'd like to find that. First, let's talk a little bit about DNA and the discovery of DNA. I believe in somewhere in the book that you mentioned that one of the discoverers of DNA said that um, the, the chances of it being accidental were just almost non-existent. Is that correct? Well, certainly. Fran Francis Crick, Crick is yes. uh, one of the co-discoverers of the, of the structure of the DNA molecule, and he's actually been quite, uh, quite uh, verbal uh, about his feelings, very outspoken, and he, uh, his book is entitled Life Itself. He, he actually states that the, the, uh, the odds of the complexities of, of life as we know it today happening by chance uh, appear to be almost miraculous. Uh, since that time, uh, in, in, I've not seen the book. I've seen it in uh, excerpts from magazine articles. He's gone so far as to use the word um, uh, that, that somehow there's been an intervention at some point. Uh, while it, we don't talk a lot about what that intervention was, he said that the, the chances of this happening randomly, the results of a random process, are, are pretty slim. Well, we talk a lot about that intervention on this radio program because we have <laughs> guests who who explore it in all kinds of different ways. Uh, and I'd like to continue to explore it with you in your particular way because that is, in a way, in the of the of toward the essence of what you're saying. Uh, let's talk a little bit now about the, the 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 discovery of the letters in particular that you that you found that were sure. that were related to, to to the god code what is the god code well the the key to, to um, we'll start with generals and we'll get more and more specific generalities get more and more specific the the key to this entire discovery uh, I, when i worked when i was a software engineer i worked in pattern recognition uh, was was some of the uh, the code that I was developing, and as as I had the opportunity when the genome was released to the public, uh, and the research that was done in the late 90s and uh, uh, in its entirety in 2000, there are certainly patterns in the genome that appear to to be sentence structures, uh, although we simply don't know what those sentences are saying. We're going to find out though and what those sentences are saying in just a couple of minutes, because we're going to be back with Greg Braden. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We'll be right back. Greg Braden, The God Code. We must not be passive. The future depends on us. The God Code represents a key to finding out who we are and how to change this world from within us. Think it can't be done? That's what you're supposed to think. The great lie that we are helpless, that we must remain passive, there is nothing to be done. Wake up to the God Code. Do it today. Get it from the unknowncountry.com store. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We're back with Greg Braden. We were talking about the discovery of the God Code within the human genome and within the genome in general. And we were just talking, Greg, before we left the air, about those sentences. And what what sentences were you talking about? In well, well, certainly, Whitley. And what, uh, once again, the bottom line, the key to this discovery is a concrete link, a numeric link between ancient alphabets and the elements that make the DNA in our bodies. In other words, what we're looking at are symbols. Today, we use the symbols of things that we call carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen to describe life in our bodies. It appears that the ancients, uh, specifically ancient Hebrews and, and many of the other uh, traditions we can get into, uh, were doing the same thing in, in a very different language. So the symbols were different. However, every one of the symbols was linked to a number, and the numbers have not changed over time. So if we give the same consideration to the modern uh, alphabet of the periodic table that we give to the ancient alphabets of letters, if we treat them the same way, uh, we begin to find this link. And one of the, the mysteries, and many of the listeners I'm sure may be familiar with this, and maybe some are not, is the fact that every every alphabet, modern or ancient, uh, has always been associated with 
uh, with numeric values linked to every letter. Each letter of every alphabet has always had a very precise, very specific number linked to the letter. The numbers don't change over time. Some of those are 5,000 years old. We don't even know where they came from. Uh, in the Hebrew alphabet, the study of these numbers is, is very common for uh, uh, scholars of the Torah and scholars of the, um, uh, of the, the science of, of numbers. It's called gematria or gematria. And it, it is this link, what we now know is that the, the mystery of where these numbers came from, the numbers associated with ancient alphabets appear to be uh, the same numbers that are linked to modern elements through a characteristic that we call atomic mass. And uh, without getting uh, uh, really technical, we don't talk about what mass is, but atomic mass is a, uh, a very well-known characteristic that uh, describes all the elements in the periodic table. And when we treat the numbers... Uh, of the periodic table, the atomic mass, and we treat them and give them the same considerations we give to the numbers in the ancient alphabets, it allows us to replace the carbons, the oxygens, the hydrogens, the nitrogens in the DNA with very specific letters in a very precise, very methodical, very systematic way. Uh, and when we do that, lo and behold, uh, the letters begin to spell words and the words begin to make uh, sentences. And uh, this is the essence of how this code in our bodies works. So, tell us more now. You you refer to the ancient alphabets as as containing the signature of this code. I want to know how that works. Well, if we, uh, I'm just going to invite the listeners, uh, our listeners this evening, to uh, to move beyond the traditional boundaries uh, of the sciences and the way we've viewed cells in the past, rather than viewing the cells as a an encapsulated mass of sticky, gooey, protoplasmic stuff that, that makes life. What science says is that within every cell of our bodies, uh, in, in humans, we have uh, 23 pairs or 46 chromosomes. And those chromosomes are made of long strands of DNA that are made of shorter segments of the DNA that we identify as genes. If we can think of the cells as libraries, and within each library, think of those chromosomes as books. And if we can think of the long strands of DNA as, as chapters within the books, and the genes as paragraphs and sentences, we begin to, to get a feel for, uh, for the metaphor of how information is, is stored in our bodies. And just as within every book, before chapter one, there's an introduction or a, a preface or a foreword uh, it appears the same thing happens in the cells of our bodies. Before we get into the deeper layers of the code, there is, is an introduction into every cell of our bodies, and it is that introduction that was the first thing that was translated. It's the subject of the book, and, and I'd like to share that uh, with our listeners tonight. Oh, good. Well, so the, the introduction, when we, when at the highest level, the, the message occurs in multiple layers. Each layer has its own code to translate it. The first code took 12 years, and it has revealed the first layer, which is a very brief message. It's the introduction into the cells of our bodies, and the introduction literally translates to the words, God eternal within the body. God eternal within the body. And we see it again and again and again uh, throughout the cells of our, our bodies and the cells of all carbon-based life. Doesn't God eternal within the body within is the literally body. written in every cell of our bodies. It, literally, when we tra when you substitute the ancient letters for the alphabets we're working with right now, in, in the book we talk about ancient Hebrew and ancient right. A Arabic. Other alphabets appear to work as well. Uh, when you take the, the the carbons, the oxygens, the nitrogens, and the hydrogens in the, the four DNA bases uh, that make up all of life, and you begin that replacement process, you find different iterations, different numbers of times where we find this message again and again. We don't know who put it there. It doesn't say who God is or how it got there or why it's there. Uh, and, and this is what's so interesting. The controversy surrounding this material is not over whether or not this message exists, because it, once you do this operation, it's there. Uh, the controversy is where it came from, how it got there, uh, why we haven't recognized it in the past, um, and, and what it means in our lives. 
That's yeah. a lot of material in a short period of time. Yeah, but it, <laughs> now I have to ask the question, what did the creators of these ancient alphabets know that we don't? Well, this is I ask myself the same question, and I think the answer may be relatively simple, Whitley. If we consider alphabets as symbols, we look into some of the oldest traditions, and I'm, I'm going to uh, go with biblical Hebrew, not because it's the oldest, rather because it's the oldest continuously used language. So we, we're using it today just as it was used 3,000 years ago. Uh, and uh, the records are among the most complete. The Hebrew history, the written history, is among the most complete. Uh, other traditions, uh, their oral histories are complete, but it's not the same as, as the, the written letters that have not changed. So in, in the Hebrew traditions, uh, in the most mystical traditions, it is said that in the beginning... Uh, that the force known as God created the universe through letters, through the letters of the alphabet. And that makes very little sense to a scientist. Uh, and believe me, I used, to <laughs> I used to come in to work Monday morning and share what I had found over the weekend with my colleagues, and before their eyes glazed over and they left the room, they told me, this doesn't make any sense. Because you but cannot it does, create, you it, cannot, doesn't, it, do, it doesn't make any sense in what context. Well, Only because of the fact that we assume that they couldn't have known anything about this. Then, well, this is the thing. If the the only way that the universe could be created with letters is if the letters are symbols representing something else. So, from that uh, perspective, and that's where I began. I said, could they have been talking about uh, using very different language, but talking about the elements of creation? Uh, because NASA says today, NASA says that 93-plus percent of our universe is created from hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. The Hebrew texts say it was created from three letters. What if those letters represented elements in another way that we're only beginning to understand? While the words may change, the numbers would not. So, so I looked at the numbers linked to those letters that the Hebrew tradition say created, the universe, Aleph, Mem, Shin, uh, subsequently uh, the letters Yud, He, Vav, Y, H, V, and there's a, a whole mystery about how that those letters are related. But if you look at, the, at those letters, Y, H, V, Yud, He, Vav, uh, and the numbers associated with them, lo and behold, they are the same numbers uh, of, of the atomic mass of hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, which uh, d does in fact uh, represent 93% of our universe and also uh, are three of the four elements of life uh, in, in the DNA and of our bodies. Carbon uh, is, is the one that was not uh, not represented uh, immediately in, in the Hebrew text. But it was in the end represented. It, it was. So, so what we're saying, the question is, how did they know? It appears somehow uh, that they knew uh, that the elements of creation of our world and our bodies could be represented by numbers that we today we call atomic mass, to them they were mystical, mysterious numbers assigned to the letters. So when they say in the beginning uh, there were three letters that were chosen that were placed into the name of the Creator, and from that name the universe, our world, and our bodies came to be, if we now substitute those letters with their equivalents from the periodic table linked by, uh, by the numbers of atomic mass, what those texts say is, in the beginning, the Creator uh, took hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen. Uh, it became His name, and and from those elements, He created His universe, uh, the world, and our bodies, and and uh, and it goes on from there. You know what's so remarkable about this also is that this law, the so-called law of three, which Buckminster Fuller called the building block of the universe, quite rightly, the idea of the positive and the negative. Uh, 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 coming into balance with one another and creating the so-called third force uh, mm -hmm. at, at hydrogen, oxygen, and then nitrogen. Uh, and apparently there was some kind of knowledge of this law among the ancients who created these alphabets. Now, I have to ask myself the question and ask you the question. We're talking about people who were creating alphabets, so you would think that with knowledge like this, it's the kind of knowledge that comes out of law, a long history of having alphabets. So what are we looking at here exactly? Uh, what, what was going on in the past? What, uh, this strange ancient presence in the world 
that's called mankind that we're beginning to see as the true mystery that it is the skeletons of our species going back hundreds of thousands of years or 150,000 years anyway uh, the mystery of our knowledge lost then found again lost then found again over the succeeding eons I'm going to ask Greg a huge question when we get back who are we this is Whitley Strieber it's dreamland we'll be right back Greg Braden, The God Code, we must not be passive. The future depends on us. The God Code represents a key to finding out who we are and how to change this world from within us. Think it can't be done? That's what you're supposed to think. The great lie that we are helpless, that we must remain passive, there is nothing to be done. Wake up to the God Code. Do it today. Get it from the unknowncountry.com store. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We're back talking with Greg Braden. He's been spinning around with that question, who are we, in the context of this marvelous book, The God Code. And by the way, gregbraden.net. Go to it to find out what Greg is doing, what where he's coming from, his wonderful work on prayer. It, there is so much to this guy. Do not miss getting into Greg Braden. If you are in the spirit and engaged in this search, as I know you are, as I am, he's an important place to go and to be and to learn from. Uh, he's a man who's accomplished something. Okay, Greg, big question. Uh, we'll give you 30 seconds to answer it. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're, you're waiting at least to the middle of the program for the, for the, the, the big, hard questions now. <laughs> <laughs> So the question is, who are we? Yeah, who are we? And I want to ask you that question in the context of our known and unknown history, and also I want to get a little bit into the lost books of the Bible. Well, certainly. We're, at, the, at the very least, we know that we are uh, we're beautiful, mysterious, mystical creatures. Uh, the ancient texts tell us that. Modern science is now saying the same thing. If we go from the way these texts are describing our past, uh, the texts say very clearly that we are the union, the marriage of uh, of something from beyond this world married with something of this world. Uh, and this is where the letters of the alphabet and the DNA are, are so key. The letters of the alphabet say, uh, in, in the Hebrew alphabet, that, that the three letters of God's name, uh, YHV, uh, which equate to the to the periodic tables, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen, those are uh, colorless, formless, odorless gases. Uh, and if we were simply made of those things, as the, the God's name is, we wouldn't be having this conversation. We would have our, our physicality wouldn't exist. Uh, however, when you add those things together numerically, when you add hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, you come up with a number that matched to the periodic table gives us uh, carbon. And carbon is the, is the physicality uh, of, uh, of our bodies, and it's, it is the earth. And, and in that way, the DNA in our bodies is mirroring what the ancient texts say to us, that we are uh, the marriage of the non-physical and the physical, of, uh, of, of spirit and matter. Um, and the texts go on to say that, uh, that we are here uh, for the purpose of, of becoming uh, beings of perfection, and that it's through the, the choices we make in our lives that, that we may achieve that. Science can only tell us what's happened in the past. The text can give us insight into why those things have happened. So what science is telling us, our own science, through both the fossil and, and the genetic record, it's saying that, that our bodies have been on this earth in this form for a long time, and genetically, that something happened Something mysterious happened to us a long time ago, and, and it's shown in the genetic record where, where we acquired genetic material that was the result of a fusion of other creatures' materials that cannot happen through nature. Chromosome 2, human chromosome 2, for example. There are, are specific genes in that chromosome, and, and, uh, and I document this in the book. Uh, the scientists are telling us that 
those genes do not occur naturally, that they were fused from other primate genes to get, make us who we are today. So science says something mysterious happened in our past. We don't know what it is. We can just see it in the genetic record. The texts say that something mysterious happened in our past, that we were intentionally uh, tweaked, if you will, or, or modified uh, to, to exist in this world in the way that we do today uh, for very specific purposes. And, and when you marry the two together, uh, perhaps we are beginning to have some insight into the true answer to the question of who are we. And you say for very specific purposes. Could you elaborate on that? Well, again, science can only tell us, uh, and, and I'm just going to, to be clear, although there was an intuitive uh, hit that that was the basis for this discovery, once that uh, was realized, uh, we use the best science available to us today to flesh out uh, everything that we're talking about. So this we're we're talking about crossing the traditional boundaries of science and, and spirituality, marrying them into a greater wisdom. So when we go into the texts, uh, uh, some of the oldest, uh, most sacred traditions of, of humankind, what they're telling us is that that we are here given the gifts of uh, of other realms, married with the gifts of this realm, and that we're given the choice. Uh, to determine how we use those gifts to either become better people and, and create a better world or, uh, or to essentially destroy ourselves. Now, this is one of these incredibly rich books that is so filled with new ideas and new information that we, I could literally interview you for 12 hours and we wouldn't <laughs> even touch the, we wouldn't even begin to scratch the surface. What I want to do now, though, is to go to in a way, to the uses of the knowledge. And I want to talk to you a little bit about prayer, because you know a lot about prayer. And uh, tell us a little bit about the lost mode of prayer. Well, what Western science, Western researchers today identify uh, in, our, in the Western world, they identify four modalities of prayer that are called prayers of supplication. And they say that we... We use these modes of prayer either individually or, or we use uh, we combine them in some way, and they're all good modes of prayer. There are no incorrect ways of praying. I'll be very clear uh, about this. Uh, and these modalities of prayer, uh, colloquial prayer, the informal prayers, uh, ritualistic prayer, um, prayers uh, uh, of uh, where we where we claim. Uh, uh, the word is escaping me, <laughs> of the modality of prayer that I'm thinking of, um, where we petition, oh, petitionary prayers. Yes. That's, that's what it is, petitionary prayers and, uh, and meditative prayers. And that, as good as all of those prayers are, there have always been references to another mode of prayer in, in the text and in, in the living cultures of people today that are not accounted for in those, uh, um, in those four modalities. Those, the four modalities typically are considered uh, prayers of supplication, where we feel powerless in the situation. So we invite the intervention from a higher power. We say, dear God or dear angels, uh, please help me in this moment. Help my loved ones to heal. Let there be peace in the world. As good as those prayers are, the lost mode of prayer reminds us that we are part of the world around us. We're part of all that we see, and that we may participate directly rather than asking for intervention. And the way that we do that is through a, a language of no words. It's a language of feeling, a specific quality of feeling based in our hearts. Uh, what quantum physicists now began to find between 1993 and, and the year 2000, they found that through our hearts, we, when we feel very specific feelings in our hearts, we are interacting with a non-conventional force of energy that now is recognized, and that that force not only changes the chemistry inside of our bodies, it, it, in addition, it, it has effects that extend beyond our bodies and have been measured at distances of many miles. So what Western science is saying is, although they don't know specifically why, they say when we feel certain feelings, we affect the world around us. The ancients are saying in this lost mode of prayer are saying when you feel this way, not only do you change your body, you change your world. And you, again, you marry those two ways of knowing together, uh, and for the first time, maybe in a long time, 
we're empowered to understand our relationship uh, to to the world and and the events around us and how to participate in those events. Now, this is not like it isn't a prayer with words. It's a it, tell us about the quantum connection with regard to this type sure, of there, prayer. This prayer is this modality of prayer is not linked to any religion. It is a non-denominational prayer. It has no words. It has no outer expression. It is simply a feeling uh, in our bodies, and it is a feeling that the prayer literally is the feeling as if the prayer has already been answered, has already been accomplished. So if we're, we're creating internal conditions that we hope that the external world will mirror. Well, what quantum physics is saying to us now is that the external world does, in fact, mirror what we have become from within. So the feelings in our bodies are mirrored in the world around us. So, for example, uh, rather than praying for peace, when we pray for something, what we are in effect saying is that it doesn't exist now. So when we're saying, please let there be peace in the world, we're actually reaffirming that there isn't peace. The fifth mode of prayer invites us to feel the feelings of peace and gratitude for that peace as if it's already there by creating those feelings inside of our bodies. First, what we do is we release a, a powerful life-affirming chemistry in our bodies. DHEA levels uh, increase over 100% in six hours time from feelings of gratitude and appreciation. So when we can feel gratitude and appreciation for the peace in our world or the healing of our loved one, and, and see them in the way that we would like to see them uh, from within, what, what Western science is showing us, specifically quantum physics, is that those kinds of feelings, that quality of emotion, actually is, is an energy form that affects the world around us, and it is measured beyond the body. I think one of the first... Uh, uh, places where researchers began to see this was in the the, the study that was done with um, the cold fusion. Um, it was supposed to be the answer for our energy problems in the 21st century, creating more energy, uh, outputting more energy than it took to create the energy. And one of the mysteries was why the cold fusion apparatus would not work consistently. Uh, sometimes it would, sometimes it wouldn't. And it took a very astute uh, young researcher and he asked a question he said why is it when the people in the room believe in cold fusion more often than not it works and that when they are skeptical more often than not it doesn't and that led to the the series of studies showing that the expectations of the researchers were part of the experiment and and with the delicate quantum nature of cold fusion it showed up very rapidly other experiments have shown that this process is with us all the time. We, we may not see it as rapidly. Uh, and uh, the effect is there, that what we feel in our bodies, feeling is a language of no words, and, and that that language is the way that we speak to, uh, to the quantum field of, this, uh, of the stuff around us. Greg, what I think you're really talking about is the science and the, the technology of the future, because we're, going, we're coming into a situation where it is going to be up to us in this way to make the world around us mirror our inner peace and our inner uh, the, the the welfare that we find within us otherwise we're going to see a collapse of everything that we hold dear this well, is this is what we really have there is no more oil to drill the environment is going to go out of whack goodness only knows what else is going to happen and by making this inner world of of peace and harmony and spreading it out around us we're going to act like magical beings i think in our own reality i think that's what it's about it's actually a very ancient wisdom an ancient technology that is used and actually utilized uh, whitley i've had the opportunity to to, to travel, to journey into some of the most pristine, uh, rugged, magnificent, and, and remote places remaining on Earth today to visit the, the people and the cultures who have retained this kind of wisdom, and they implement it in their lives day in and day out. In the West, we have strayed 
from these relationships. We believe we're so separate from our world and so separate from one another. And you know, we hear this all the time uh, in in the monasteries in Tibet. Uh, I've, I've had the opportunity to uh, both in 1998 and again in 2001. Uh, to to be with the monks and the nuns and and the uh, the lamas, who literally said to us through the translators that feeling is is the prayer. It's not the words. It's not the words that we speak. It's the feeling that underlies those words. Now that we know so much was lost in the Western spiritual literature, both Christian and Hebrew Bibles were edited, and uh, uh, a large number of books were removed from both. Yes. And it's interesting because it's in, in the books that were removed is where we find some of the greatest clues uh, that describe precisely this internal technology that, that we do find in the Native American cultures and uh, in our country today and in the Andes in South America, throughout the uh, Nepal and, and Tibet. And we've just been in India. We were, uh, were less than, than a month home from, from India. We find this in many of the traditions uh, that are uh, used there as well. So it's and, an ancient ancient science. It's not obsolete. And in our own Western world, we must regain this because this is this is the tool that we have, our essential survival tool. This is the life. It's the lifeboat. This is Whitley Strieber and Greg. I would like to thank you for being with us. It's been an, a truly extraordinary experience. His book, The God Code. Don't miss the God Code. If you get one book, get this, because this is a mind-opening and eye-opening book. It is so deeply and profoundly empowering. It's one of the most empowering things I've ever come across. And this show, as you know, is about empowering us to rescue the future, uh, which is what we, uh, this is our charge. This is what we must do in this generation. It seems impossible. It is not impossible. It is very, very possible. Don't be passive. Greg Braden's website, gregbraden.org. Get into Greg Braden. He's a journeyer. It's a journey well worth taking. Thanks for being with us, Greg. Well, many thanks for being such a gracious host and uh, for creating the forum so we can have these conversations. Well, good. We'll be back with you again one of these days very soon, I hope. And I look forward to it. Blessings on your journey. Take good care. Greg Braden, The God Code, We Must Not Be Passive. The future depends on us. The God Code represents a key to finding out who we are and how to change this world from within us. Think it can't be done? That's what you're supposed to think. The great lie that we are helpless, that we must remain passive, there is nothing to be done. Wake up to the God Code. Do it today. Get it from the unknowncountry.com store. One reporter who loves mysteries is radio's leading science journalist, Linda Moulton Howe. She's an Emmy Award winning TV producer, documentary filmmaker, and writer, and reporter and editor for EarthFiles.com, the Internet's most respected edge science website. Tonight, she has a special report for us on some very unusual elk and cattle deaths. Here she is from Philadelphia, Linda Moulton Howe. Thanks, Whitley. It was uh, February 8, 2004, that Wyoming coyote hunters contacted the Wyoming Game and Fish Department in Rollins to report that they had found two live elk down on their chest and unable to get up. The location was about 15 miles southwest of Rollins on land actually owned and managed by the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. A Rollins field biologist went to investigate, found the two elk, and subsequently other field investigators found another 80 live paralyzed elk. The number of debilitated animals has now risen to almost 300 today in the middle of March. Nine more, all alive, were found the weekend of March 6th to 7th. And sadly, all of the elk found alive and paralyzed have been euthanized to put them out of their misery. You can see a photograph of one of the healthy-looking elk who was not able to get up on her legs at my website, www.earthfiles.com. 
Just go to the headlines page and click on the elk paralysis story. There are also photographs of a helicopter used to lift out 10 of the live elk for necropsies by Wyoming State veterinarian pathologists who are still stumped. This week I talked about the baffling phenomenon with Tom Reed, publication supervisor for the Wyoming Game and Fish Department in Cheyenne, Wyoming. A very odd malady. Uh, these wild elk are, are all um, pretty alert. Uh, they're very cognizant of what's going on around them. They're very afraid when our people uh, approach them, but they can't get they can't get away. They can't rise. And this is a very uh, harsh environment. It's a, a, a sagebrush step um, uh, zone that's basically high desert uh, with uh, you know uh, sub zero. Uh, wind chill factors in, the, in this time of year. Um, uh, lots of uh, lots of snow and uh, wind and um, very remote area. And so uh, we've been euthanizing these animals, um, and uh, pos- probably the majority of them, two thirds of them anyway, have been euthanized by our field personnel because of the conditions and, and because it, this thing, whatever it is, is not really killing the animals, but it's basically debilitating them so badly that if we don't take care of them right away, um, in terms of euthanizing them, they die a pretty horrible death. Um, pretty, uh, they can't. They basically eat everything around them that they can reach, um, you know, right down to the dirt, um, and then they die of starvation or dehydration. Oh my God! So it's a very uh, emotional thing for our people, um, you know, because wildlife is something we very much care about. And uh, we're, we just don't want to see these uh, animals suffering. So it's been kind of an ongoing uh, three weeks of, of uh, uh, just some real hard times for us emotionally and, and getting these animals taken care of. And this is a widely scattered area, po- uh, probably about 50 square miles of uh, uh, public and private land um, that they're scattered over. And so, as you can imagine, uh, with field personnel, you know, and we've also used a, a few, um, you know, folks in the air uh, in helicopters as well as uh, fixed-wing aircraft to try and locate more elk, but it's very hard to find them. So some of them that we find, and we find them too late to really help them and put them out of their misery, which is really distressing just because you could tell that they died a pretty hard death. What have pathologists learned so far? Well, so far um, we've necropsied about 10 elk. Um, and we've uh, ruled out a lot of the major, uh, you know, uh, bacteriological, uh, viral, uh, and uh, many of the toxic metals have all been ruled out. Uh, for example, uh, arsenic and selenium, uh, manganese, um, zinc, lead, all that's been ruled out as, as a, a possible toxic poisoning. Ruled out uh, all the common uh, bacteriological things. We've ruled out chronic wasting disease. Um, have they found bit. any prions in any of these animals? No. No. So it's uh, completely unrelated to uh, chronic wasting disease. Mm-hmm. And and the thing uh, the thing about it is is here these these are very healthy animals from every appearance. I mean they they're almost all primarily breeding age cows, three to five year olds, and uh, the fetuses are in great state of development. You'd they'd exactly be what you'd expect uh, elk this time of year to be in. Um, the bone marrow and the, you know the fat content, and everything is just absolutely fabulous. So it's not a, a wasting disease or a starvation type of disease. It's it's or, or uh, you know we're we're really keying in on uh, possible toxin either in the environment um, or um, or or something that maybe was man caused. Is there uh, anything that veterinarian pathologists are now uh, contemplating could cause? What sounds like some kind of nerve disease problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, literally, there could be hundreds of uh, different uh, types of toxins that could be caused by that could cause these symptoms. So uh, we really aren't eliminating anything. Uh, you know, we're just kind of step by step by step going through the thing and, and eliminating those toxins. And, and certainly, for a small agency such as ours, it's very time consuming and very costly. Um, so. You know, it's just gonna it's gonna be a re- repeated long process of, of eliminating each of these toxins. Have you found any other animals in that 50 square mile area that seem to be affected the same way as the elk? 
Yeah, that's a great question, Linda. And honestly, no. Um, the answer to that is this is only affecting elk. And, and in that area, there's uh, you know cows, uh, there's uh, horses, um, there's antelope, there's a few deer, and nothing uh, is nothing has been affected but the elk. And that's that's very con- disconcerting to us because um, elk are, are such a very hardy, tough animal. Um, they can, they're built for really tough winters, tough conditions. And have uh, scavengers that have fed on these, uh, the few carcasses that you found that are actually dead. Uh, have you found any dead scavengers? No, we haven't. In fact, the carcasses that, you know, of the, of the animals that we're euthanizing, we're leaving out there as well because it's a, you know, public land. There are a ton of scavengers. There's eagles, um, coyotes, uh, um, you know, ravens, magpies, crows, and they're all doing fine. They're not, it's, so it's nothing, uh, you know, there's no indication that this, whatever this toxin is, that it's exa- uh, jumping from species to species as they consume um, carrion. Well, this seems very bizarre, and I'm wondering if in talking with veterinarian pathologists or biologists or zoologists, have you had anybody hypothesize what would target just an elk central nervous system? Right. Um, and, yeah, bizarre is a great word for it, um, and I think that's got everyone scratching their head, at the, and certainly there have been a bunch of um, uh, hypo- hypotheses flying around out there, um, and that's why I think people right now are keen in on something that possibly the elk have consumed and, and something that would be consumed just by elk. What would that be? We don't know. Yeah, we just don't know right now, and, and so we're just... We're looking for answers. We've got people out in the field uh, right now. You know, antelope are typically a browsing animal. Horses and, and cattle are grazing animals. Uh, elk do both. So that's really um, disconcerting for us because we just plain do not know right now. And uh, we've got folks out in the field collecting plant samples, uh, also looking for more additional elk that may be down. So um, We'll get to the bottom of it one way or the other, we hope. I mean, certainly the Wyoming State Veterinary Laboratory in Laramie, Wyoming, is uh, <clears throat> probably the tops in the country in terms of, uh, you know, narrowing in on things like that. But certainly the, the definitive work on uh, such things is uh, chronic wasting disease and brucellosis comes right out of that laboratory. So we've got some great professionals on that, and, and we'll hope to get to the bottom of it. Which makes it even more amazing that they are stumped after a month. Yeah, exactly, and and you know, well, there's a couple of things we could think about. Is number one is it's not, even though there's some great heads there, you know, it's not a ton of uh, personnel. It's, you know, there's probably oh, maybe a dozen people that are working on it, and they're working on it constantly. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and then we're also looking at pretty limited resources in terms of a small state game and fish agency that's looking at this. So, um, you know, I, I think the month is. Uh, certainly disconcerting in, ter- in terms of time, but I think it's going to be a time-consuming thing just because there's so all the usual suspects have been eliminated and we're fairly uh, standard procedures to eliminate those. Now it's going to be something that's a little bit odder that folks have not seen. And uh, of the 300 elk that you've either euthanized or you have found dead so far in uh, a month, do you have new cases that are suggesting that this is an ongoing problem? Yes, we we found uh, another nine over the weekend. Five of those elk uh, looked like they'd been down for some time. They were right on the. These are all live elk. All nine were alive, but the five were almost not li- alive anymore. They were uh, right on the border of uh, of dying. Um, and then four that were looked like they had just recently been affected by whatever it is that uh, they've gotten into. Um, and so, yeah, it is disconcerting to us um, that this is still continuing. Whatever the contamination, it must have happened at a time when the bulls had already separated to the higher ground for winter, since this seems to have only affected the adult, mostly pregnant cows left behind at the lower elevations. I know that the Wyoming Game Department has ruled out many metallic toxins, such as arsenic, selenium, manganese, lead, and zinc poisoning, but metallic toxins do cause degeneration in nerves similar to the elk symptoms. Another nerve poison can be organophosphate pesticides. Tom Reed said many plants have been sampled for analysis, but so far no answers have jumped out. 
And since other animals and scavengers in the Rollins region have shown no symptoms of paralysis, what would the female elk be eating exclusively that other animals are not? Another issue is the Rollins, Wyoming area, in the Rollins, Wyoming area, is water contamination from oil and natural gas drilling. I received a letter from a former Wyoming resident about this situation. Quote, my husband and I lived in Wyoming. We spent every weekend traveling the state. The area of the elk deaths is known for its polluted ground and aquifers due to the drilling of oil and natural gas. We drove down many BLM roads looking at sites and found pools of standing water that were bright green and steaming next to oil gas drills. Dick Cheney, vice president, opened the BLM land up to these companies with no contractual obligation for them to clean up after themselves or to prevent this contamination. Now many of the running streams and springs have been wasted by these contaminants. Now, uh, just before this Dreamland broadcast, I called Tom Reed again at the Wyoming Game and Fish Department to see if any test results had come back positive. He said there are still no answers after a month, and some lab results are not expected back for another week or so. I will continue to follow up on this elk paralysis mystery and report any new developments at Dreamland and EarthFiles.com. But the elk are not the only unusual animal deaths that have re- occurred recently. Last Saturday on March 6th, over a 12-hour period between 7.30 a.m. and 7.30 p.m., A rancher in Cedar Ridge, Colorado, lost 31 of his cattle in violent, kicking death. More about that animal mystery after this break. This is Linda Moulton Howe, reporter and editor of EarthFiles.com, reporting for Dreamland. And this is Whitley Strieber. This is Dreamland. We'll be right back. The work of Linda Moulton Howe, the amazing work of Linda Moulton Howe, the world's greatest reporter of edge news and edge topics. She has got a website, earthfiles.com. Go there frequently. You will never, never forget what you find on earthfiles.com. The best website, the best reporting of its kind in the world. Linda Moulton Howe, earthfiles.com. Don't miss a single day. George Filer of Filer's Files, the world's leading UFO newsletter, has been making a sensation in the papers lately with his claims about the Mars rover photographs. Is he right, and is NASA really holding something back from us? Well, listen to what George has to say. Do that by going to the subscriber section and listening to the interview with him that I have just done. It is hot stuff, and it's like everything in the subscriber section. Great information, fascinating stuff that you can't get elsewhere. Become a subscriber to unknowncountry.com. Keep this website rolling. It's essential that you do it. Unknowncountry.com. Go to that subscribe tab on the top of the homepage right now and get started. It'll be loads of fun, believe me, loads of value for you, and it will help this website keep going. Join us. Cedar Ridge, Colorado is west of Grand Junction in a Rocky Mountain region that has long been the home of farmers and ranchers. And one of those ranchers had 31 of his cattle die last weekend in only 12 hours. Vern Hillis estimates the one yearling bull and 30 mostly pregnant heifers were worth about $31,000. Veterinarians were not able then to answer what caused them to stumble and fall down, kicking and tossing their heads until their last breath. Rancher Vern Hillis is 62 years old and was born and raised on the ranch, first settled by his grandfather. In the past half century of working the family's 1,400 acres, Mr. Hillis told me that he's never encountered anything like this mass death of half his herd. I talked with him this week about what happened. The cows died in less than 12 hours. And uh, were you there uh, with any of them when, uh, from alive to death? Well, more or less. There was some of the later ones. Now, the, I fed them at 10 o'clock Friday morning. And everything was healthy and no sick cattle or nothing. And I went to get a load of hay down in the lower valley and come back and unloaded. Everything seemed to be all right. 
stand. And then I went into my sister's for supper. And then when I come back late that night, it was raining and stuff. And I went over and checked the cows that was calfing to be sure I didn't have one needing help or anything. And then I got up uh, about 7 o'clock and took off and went over to check them again that morning. And I seen a cow in the ditch kicking. And I got out and tried to get her out of the ditch, and I glanced up, and the field was full of dead cows. Huh? But well, the ones that was still partially alive, they were just uh, uh, kicking real fast with their feet and throwing their heads. Huh. Uh, that, uh, you couldn't do to get them up or nothing. They were just kicking and grounding in their own fluid. Had you ever seen any of your animals like that before? Uh, no, uh, I have found some that had died from poison before, or, you know, up on the hill, poison weed or something, but nothing like this. These deaths where they were kicking fast, what is the difference? Well, most of the ones that I've come across up from the hills, they usually die without the convulsion and stuff, kicking and fighting like that. A lot of them just, uh... You find them just kind of laying in a natural position or something, and they're just dead. It, uh, uh, these, uh, they were kicking and, well, they were bleeding internally and grounding in their own fluid. <laughs> it was a very dis, uh, painful death. Uh, they bloated up real bad from it. I don't know what kind of poison it was or nothing. It wasn't a very pretty sight. And I went and got my four-wheeler and went around. There was 27 dead or down a kicking at that time. And this was Saturday morning? Saturday morning at about 7.30. Gosh. And did you call the sheriff immediately and a vet and get yeah, them out I there? Yeah, I called the vet first and then the sheriff's department. And were they out there on the scene pretty quickly? Well, yeah, the vet was out here, and as I say, he took, uh, done an autopsy type deal on two of them, the older cow and a uh, younger cow, and took the stuff back to his office. He said he thought he'd probably have an answer for me in a, oh, probably an hour, hour and a half, what killed him. Well, he returned with the state veterinary, taking more samples. And we're still waiting for what killed him. As I say, it was kind of a I figure somebody doctored a bucket of grain and give it to them. It's kind of what I figure happened. But, but I may be wrong. I don't know. Wouldn't they have found the poison, if it were that obvious, on Saturday? Well, the cows would eat all the grain up. And the reason I say it, I think it was in the grain is the ones that died was the ones that was, I call the grain hogs that hit the grain and eat it the quickest. They're the ones that died quick, and the ones that didn't get as much took longer to die. There was two that took uh, didn't die until after midnight Saturday. But wouldn't the vet have been able to confirm a poison in their stomach in the necropsy? Well, they've been running tests on it, and they haven't come up with what kind of poison it is. Mm-hmm. They don't know. They, they, they're kind of just... As I say, it uh, went through two labs already, uh, running tests and stuff, and they haven't come up with uh, any what the poison is yet. So uh, it really, at this point... It's still a mystery, basically what it is. Have you ever had anything like this happen before? No. You lose a few, you know, during calfing season or... As I say, from poison weed in the hills, and predators, and that kind of stuff. But you kind of expect that. Mm-hmm. But this kind of, uh, you know, massive kill, uh, poisoning, that it's nothing like it. And you had lost 31 animals Saturday to Saturday night. Did any of them that you saw that were alive try to get up on their legs? Well, they tried. Well, I had two that got, was kind of sickly and down that did get up and go again, and they're still going. Hmm. They survived it, and I figured they just got a mild dosage of it. Hmm. 
And was there any uh, indication of paralysis in any of the animals that you saw alive? Uh, well, they just staggered and stumbled and fell down. They just kind of just staggered around and went down and go to kicking because they was puffing up like a balloon. <laughs> they were puffed up real tight even while they were still kicking alive. Did the vet say that he'd ever seen a big bloat on an animal like that that uh, kicked uh, while it no, died? It, uh, whatever the poison was was causing them to bloat up. Had the vet seen it before? Uh, he didn't say that anything about it, but uh, they pretty well knew it was poison when they left here because <laughs> they said there was no known diseases that would kill that many cow and that cows in that late the time without some symptoms. And so, it was, you know, it, I figure maybe probably a lot of them, you know, they didn't start dying. It was probably less than eight hours, probably, as somebody took some grain in there with poison in it after dark. Which is so cruel that it's beyond uh, uh, understanding yeah, just, about why. Yeah, you just can't imagine the, the, the number. There's been a lot of people come out and, well, the one newsman, he turned plum white and got plum sick but taking pictures of it. Well, it turns out that Mr. Hillis's suspicions about somebody poisoning his grain are fortunately not correct. Just before this Dreamland broadcast, I received an email from Vern Hillis, who had just received a phone call from one of the veterinarians. The test results for a milkweed that grows in Delta County, which is extremely deadly to cattle, came back positive. The only positive out of approximately 100 things that they went through trying to find out what had happened to these cattle. So apparently Vern Hillis was lucky for half a century that none of his herds got into this dangerous milkweed before. So at least one animal death mystery has been answered. But in the meantime, the unusual elk deaths without explanation in Wyoming have fish and wildlife managers, law enforcement, and ranchers there nervous about what could happen next. So it's nice, Whitley, to have at least one answer when there are so many other puzzling things in our environment. Well, it is nice to have at least one answer, but, you know, I want to return to the elk and and I can't help remembering a couple of years ago a bizarre story of a group of hunters seeing an elk taken up aboard into a UFO right. in Washington State, not so far away. And I just worry always that something, you know, bizarre. And yet, at the same time, uh, maybe they will come up with some kind of an answer s sooner or later that makes makes some sense. I I think that. The, if if so, it's almost certainly going to involve that water. And I have to ask myself the question, since it's highly political, if that's the case, will we ever know? It's a very interesting question. Yeah, because I, I would I, assume that the administration will just will just act to suppress any information like that or fire get fired anybody who dares to speak out about it. The one good thing is that Tom Reed has been extremely forthcoming and really, his heart and uh, people that also work in the game and fish department in Wyoming, when you talk with them, you do realize that they empathize with these animals, that they are um, uh, their job is to help manage them and help keep them healthy. And I think that in this case, they feel so badly about all these paralyzed elk that no matter what happens, that they are going to try to tell everybody what did happen, no matter what kind of political links there might be to uh, oil and natural gas. Uh, there are people out there who are very upset. Well, thank you very much, Linda, for an absolutely terrific report, as always. And this is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We'll be right back. 
George Filer of Filer's Files, the world's leading UFO newsletter, has been making a sensation in the papers lately with his claims about the Mars rover photographs. Is he right, and is NASA really holding something back from us? Well, listen to what George has to say. Do that by going to the subscriber section and listening to the interview with him that I have just done. It is hot stuff, and it's like everything in the subscriber section. Great information, fascinating stuff that you can't get elsewhere. Become a subscriber to unknowncountry.com. Keep this website rolling. It's essential that you do it. Unknowncountry.com. Go to that subscribe tab on the top of the homepage right now and get started. It'll be loads of fun, believe me, loads of value for you, and it will help this website keep going. Join us. Well, this is Whitley Streber, and this has been Our World Today, and the, the order, the eloquent order, uh, to me, has always been the language of uh, of, of a, something much greater that we're all all related to. So while I I was working as an engineer, and by the way, as a software engineer um, on the MX missile project, the uh, the Peacekeeper missile, as I was working with those things during the day, the nights and the weekends, I've always uh, taken that time to research the most ancient traditions, the oldest cultures, uh, looking for the wisdom of our past that bridges the the science of, of our time today in, in a meaningful way uh, so it was a, this is is a logical next step rather than I think a radical departure from uh, from what I've done in the past the the impetus perhaps was the recognition of what the wars of the 20th century the, the, the path that they've led us upon and the realization that the thinking that led to those kinds of wars is still in place the thinking that thinking is in place today, early in the 21st century. Well, well, it is in place today, and it's really scary because we are building toward another terrible conflagration. It, when you look at the possibility that the environment is going to become less and less able to support us over the next 50 years or 100 years, in the sense that we're going to be oil. Uh, is going to be reduced in quantity. Uh, prices of oil are going to become much higher, almost unimaginably. So there's a distinct possibility of a sudden climate change and severe environmental breakdown. Under pressure like that, the possibility, as the Pentagon has said just last week, of there being appalling wars of an unimaginable kind exists. And precisely, precisely. And yet, Greg, you speak of in every cell of every life the name of God, and this is what stands for man and against this darkness that seems to be descending upon us. It's as if the 20th century it kind of it lies exhausted at our feet now, burned to a cinder, but the coals are still glowing and beginning here and there to flare once again. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We'll get more deeply into the God Code with Greg Braden in just a moment. We'll be right back. Greg Braden, the God Code. We must not be passive. The future depends on us. The God Code represents a key to finding out who we are and how to change this world from within us. Think it can't be done? That's what you're supposed to think. Welcome to another edition of Dreamland. Uh, on the website, there is a new Whitley's Journal up. Don't miss this. It is about an encounter experience I had last February, the first one in quite a long time. that contained a truly profound and unexpected lesson. I don't think you will ever have read anything quite like it. I don't think there's been anything quite like it. It's one of these genuinely new things that happened, and... You'll be most fascinated, and stay tuned later because Linda has got an extraordinarily chilling report about something just awful happening to elk in the Pacific Northwest that you don't want to miss. Before that, we're going to have Greg Braden with us talking about his book, The God Code, 
uh, he has discovered the name of God written in every cell of every living organism. The kingdom of heaven is within you, Jesus said, and it turns out to be quite literally true. We are marked with the name of God. Prepare to be awed by this. Next week, one of the greats of our era will be with us. Russell Targ has got a new book, Limitless Mind, out. Russell is one of the founders of the SRI Research Institute remote viewing program that led to a whole new way of looking at mankind and looking at the world. He is truly one of the greats of our era. So be prepared to be awed next week again by Russell Targ. It's going to be very, very exciting stuff. For our subscribers this week, we have got an incredible program. We've got... Filer, George Filer of Filer's Files is going to be with us, and he's talking about Mars. I think you probably are aware of the fact that George has been quoted in newspapers around the country and around the world recently saying there's something more to the Mars photos that are coming back than NASA and JPL are willing to admit. Well, let's hear what he has to say, and uh, I urge you, by the way, subscribe to UnknownCountry.com. It's just the best thing you could possibly do for your own mind. Open it and open it wide with a subscription. Be generous to us because we are generous to you and you can keep this thing going by being a subscriber. Take responsibility for Unknown Country. Help us. Subscribe. Go to the subscribe tab now. Now, for you subscribers, you'll find that there are little silences here and there in the show, very short ones. This is where the commercials that the people who are listening on the main website are hearing aren't because they don't go into the subscriber section. So I hope you enjoy that aspect of it. You'll just hear an occasional commercial about the book itself, uh, the, the author's book of the week, and that will be it. There will be nothing else. And although I think this week there may be a couple of extra ones in the Linda Moulton House section, that will not normally happen. It did this week, but it normally won't. So enjoy the show as much as I am enjoying it. I'm having I'm such an exciting time with this. This is really something. Greg Braden, it's awesome stuff. Uh, this is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We'll be right back. Well, I am very happy to have Greg Braden back with us. It's always a wonderful experience uh, interviewing Greg because this is somebody who stays way, way out at the leading edge, uh, which is where we'd all love to be all the time, and some of us are and some of us aren't, but Greg certainly is. And he's got a new book out called The God Code, which is nothing less than and discovery about our bodies that it indicates the presence of God within us. Remember, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is within you. Well, Greg has got an extraordinary idea about just what that means, and we're going to get into that during the course of talking about the God Code. Uh, I, we had, I believe, the Isaiah effect on Dreamlands uh, some a year or so ago, a, a very popular show. The God Code, the secret of our past, the promise of our future. Greg, it, could, let's begin by, you have been researching and studying the relationship, I guess, between uh, um, ancient texts and modern knowledge for a long time. Could you tell us where you are kind of coming from at this point? Well, sure, Whitley. I'm, I'm going to begin by saying uh, it, it's a, a pleasure to be here, and it's absolutely exhilarating to be able to share what we're going to to, to speak about over this uh, this next little while. The, the the material that we're going to discuss uh, this evening is uh, it's the result of a research project that began uh, when I was an engineer uh, in the defense industry in the last years of the Cold War, and it is an ongoing project that is yet to be completed. So what we are talking about now is what we know now, and the bottom line to uh, to the, the research that has happened thus far is that we've found a uh, a concrete link, a tangible connection between the human genome that describes uh, the cells of of uh, all life and and our body specifically, and an ancient alphabet. Uh, and I've got to, to tell you, as a scientist, the, the the concept is absolutely mind-boggling, uh, and at the same time, it makes so much sense, and it is so eloquent and so simple when we really get into the material and see how it's laid out. Uh, and what it says to us 
uh, is that beyond a shadow of a doubt, there's an intentionality underlying our existence um, that we are related to one another and to, to all forms of life uh, that, that share this phenomenon with us, and very probably uh, to, to, to something even greater. And it is those principles uh, that, uh, that make this material so, so exhilarating to share because of the implications of what they mean in, in our world today. So I know that was a long answer and probably straight off of the brief question you just asked me. But <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. That's but, fine. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a place to begin um, from a, a non-religious, non-denominational perspective as an engineer. Uh, I began a search for a principle, Whitley, that, that would exclude no one, that would include every human who's ever walked this earth, a unifying principle uh, in the hopes that once we find such a principle, it makes the reasons for the wars of our past obsolete. And what historians are telling us right now is the 20th century, uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt, bar none, was the single bloodiest century in all of recorded human history on a per capita basis. And it was also the century in which we made the most advance uh, uh, scientifically and, but interestingly enough, not ethically, because we are still, we did arguably the worst thing in history during the 20th century in the form of the Holocaust. Mm. Uh, the most terrible crime perhaps that has ever been cre ever been committed by man against man and i don't include in this by the way the crucifixion because it was really not a crime it was a it was something else uh entirely uh, but it, it, but this was definitely a crime and it was only one of many the dreadful things that the japanese did in china were almost beyond the imagination and yet they revealed a dark Part of the human spirit that all of us need to address and accept within ourselves, otherwise it will keep returning and eventually, I'm sure, destroy us. Well, this is this is the the impetus, uh, the many many reasons uh, for doing the kind of research, and, and we can talk about this throughout the the program. But the many reasons for doing this research, uh, as an engineer. Uh, in the defense industry during the Cold War, I had the opportunity to see behind the scenes how really frightening uh, the events of that war were. And it's a war, the Cold War was a very interesting war. It wasn't, didn't have the publicity uh, that many of the other wars have had in the 20th century. Um, you know, we didn't see soldiers uh, arriving in uh, by water, by land, and by air. It was, it was a war that was fought uh, from a very different perspective. On the one hand, on the other hand, uh, many people are simply not aware of how frighteningly close both sides came during that time to doing the unthinkable and unleashing uh, the, the worst weapons technology that we've ever developed uh, on a, on a full-scale basis. And, and the thinking that has led to those kinds of wars, to, the, to what we saw happening in the 20th century and the frightening statistics and the Holocaust that we're speaking about, some of the best minds of our time, right at the turn of the century, they said that the greatest threat to our survival as a species is not the, the impact of a rogue asteroid or, or, uh, or viruses unleashed upon the world or, uh, or even the breakdown of the environment. They said while all those things are are possible and they're important. They said the next 10 to 15 years are critical in the survival of our species because of our propensity to solve our problems through war. And the war has been based upon our differences, differences of heritage, bloodlines, borders, um, uh, the color of our skin or our wealth. And the discovery that we're going to speak about here uh, in this program, the discovery of a, a literal text message encoded as the cells of every human who's ever walked this earth, the, the, the existence of that message tells us uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt that at the most fundamental level, uh, at, at the, the, the basis of life itself, those differences simply become obsolete. They fall apart because there is uh, a common code, a common thread, and a message that lives in every cell of every human. And now that we're beginning to understand that message, it invites us to look at ourselves differently.
Now, let me, I want to backtrack a little bit, and I want to get into this more deeply, but I want to go kind of in a slightly different direction. I want to begin with where you begin, Greg. You begin, it's the Cold War, you are in the hard sciences. You're an engineer. Uh, you're working for places like Martin Marietta, Phillips Petroleum, Cisco. What happened? What changed you? Or did you change, or did you just begin to? Because this is a such a seems like such a such a departure for you, as if you were set on a kind of a journey. A burning question came to you. What happened? Well, that's a good question. Many people, uh, the way that question comes to me often is is uh, what what was it that uh, that made me take the what many people see as a quantum leap from the the hard sciences into the kinds of things we're speaking about now, and I'm. I guess for me it's less of a leap and less of, uh, of a departure and more of a, of a logical progression, a next step. Uh, for me, Whitley, the, the study of the sciences has always been a study of, uh, of a higher power and a creation or a force. Uh, as I studied uh, crystal systems as a geologist and uh, uh, ocean sciences and, uh, and, and mathematics and, and the uh, life sciences, those are the ways that we come to know uh, the, the forces 